Hello everyone, welcome to another evening of our 242 series. My name is Alfred Wadi, I'm one of your small group directors serving here on the Yonkers campus. So before we begin anything, I'd like to welcome, give a warm welcome to those watching us on Zoom. Thanks for joining us tonight. For our brothers and sisters watching from the venue, the fireside, and to all of you lovely people seated here, thanks for joining us. Great to have you. Tonight is exciting for two reasons. The first is, this is our last 242 meeting for the semester. The next time we resume would be in May. And then secondly, Pastor is going to do a part two of his teaching on fasting. If you'd like to follow along with what Pastor Child will be teaching tonight, please go to the Cross Assembly app to the notes section and you can pull the notes from there. You notice we have it in English and in Spanish, so feel free to take the one you're more comfortable with. And then lastly, if you have any questions for Pastor Chad, please send them via text to the number that will be shown on the screen behind him. And he'll get to them at the end with time. All right, so with that, let's pray and invite Pastor Chad on stage. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather freely to study your word. We pray as, as Paul did, that you would flood the eyes of our hearts and understand it with your light. Let us know the hope to which you've called us and let us understand the riches of the glorious inheritance we have in you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, brother. Thank you. Man, I tell you, when I hear a man like that, that has this exotic international accent, I'm like, I just feel like an old country redneck or something, man. I love, I love that. Hey, let's say hello to our uh, North Raleigh campus that's watching us. And let's say hello to the Benson campus. And I want you to see how our Benson campus tonight is honoring and celebrating our teaching on fasting. I think we actually have a picture of the, there we go. <laughs> they got boxes and boxes of Domino's pizza that they'll eat while I'm talking about fasting this evening. So. Hey, before we get into the, the, the uh, teaching on fasting, I, I do want to talk about this because some of y'all have been asking. See, I, I'm, I'm doing this to get us ready for our next level of the, um, of the prayer ministry. And so, I mean, part of our prayer ministry is going to be to really encourage us to fast. And uh, somebody asked, actually, I've had several people say, now, where are we at with this reboot of our prayer ministry? So let me just tell you, we got four steps uh, this has nothing to do with our study tonight other than to give you a roadmap as to where we're going with this prayer ministry. Which, incidentally, are y'all excited about that? 
I am. It's going to be incredible. I don't know if John, is John in here tonight? I don't know. Uh, John Jay, if, what's that? He's in, okay. He's in the lobby. Yeah, it's good. Good, good staff guy being out in the lobby when he's supposed to be in here. All right, so uh, John, number one, is going to really help us reboot our 24-7 prayer ministry, which it will not start 24-7 here on campus. There's a lot of logistics a lot of security stuff. But how many of y'all remember the wall of prayer where you'd sign up for a, a time, you know, an hour slot during the week and we would send you some prayer requests? We're gonna reboot that whole 24-7 prayer concept. That's the first step. And then second step, we're gonna start having seasons of prayer and fasting. Like you'll just hear me announce one Sunday, everybody let's gather together this Saturday and let's just pray for the three or four hours and call on the name of the Lord. Or a church, you know, this Friday night, I'm, I'm getting hypotheticals. Don't show up this Friday night for this. But this Friday night, we're going to just uh, stay here from 9 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning, just calling on the name of the Lord. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing, that kind of stuff. So rebooting the 24-7 prayer, seasons of prayer and fasting. And then here's another big thing. I want every pastor, director on staff to have a group of trained intercessors that, like, if it's pastor so-and-so, uh, he's got six people who are trained to be intercessors for, for them. I just, I've never seen spiritual leaders under attack like I'm seeing right now. And I really felt the Lord wants us to raise up trained intercessors for every one of our leaders on staff. So we'll be doing that. And then so rebooting 24-7 prayer, seasons of prayer, training intercessors for our pastors. And then number four, then we're gonna start, there'll be times where we just during the week open up our building uh, for times of prayer, so like on your lunch hour, you can come here and just pray here in the sanctuary, and, and that's, that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge because it's not as easy as the doors unlock, y'all come on in. There's some security stuff that we have to look at, but that's kind of where we're going with our prayer ministry. So let's talk about fasting since we're rebooting this prayer ministry because that's an integral part of praying, which by the way, if you have questions, um, I was gonna say questions or comments, I don't want your comments. I do want questions. You can uh, text that, and we'll uh, go over a couple of these questions tonight. But um, I was going to share with you this week and next week nine different fasts that we see in the Bible. And then I forgot we don't have 242 next week, and then we're off for, for the next month after that. So I, I'm going to kind of call an audible here, and instead of going over the nine fasts this week and next week, let me just give you this acronym, F-A-S-T, to, to just kind of um, give you a synopsis of the benefits of fasting, whether you fast for a meal or a day, or you start working on your fasting muscles and you get to the point where you're fasting for a week or two weeks. What are some benefits from fasting? Remember I said last week, generally speaking, fasting means no food. Now, there are different kinds of fasts where, well, this particular fast, I used to hear these guys talk about, I fast for 21 days every year. And I always felt bad. And I'm like, man, I've never fasted for 21 days. And you, you start doing some digging. Yeah, I, I fast from carbohydrates for 21 days or, or whatever. And I'm, not, I'm ridiculing that, but, but I, my brain was going a different direction when they said I, I fast for 21 days. I really want you to try to get to the point where you don't eat at least one meal, or as you start to build on that, two meals, or an extended amount of time. And what happens when you and I start to engage in fasting? Let me give you this acronym, F-A-S-T. F is for fellowship. Fasting is our way of laying aside distractions and drawing closer to Jesus. And I think I gave you a definition uh, from John Piper this past week. John Piper said this, fasting is feasting on Jesus. I give up food so that I can draw closer to Jesus. And a sister shared this book that she just got. It's a great book by John Piper called A Hunger for God. It's a very small book, but uh, where Piper goes a little bit more into that concept of fasting is feasting on Jesus. If you want a good little book on uh, fasting, that's a good book, A Hunger for God. Um, I, I remember this. I was a Southern Baptist pastor I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoken tongues, but I was a secret agent. I didn't tell any Baptist. I didn't want to get kicked out of the Baptist church. So I was a Southern Baptist pastor, spoken tongues, but, but here's what happened. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, that wasn't the end. It was just the beginning 
that ignited a deeper hunger than I'd ever had for Jesus Christ. And so I remember calling different places, saying, man, I just want to take a couple days to, to pray and fast, and uh, I'm a pastor, and I couldn't find anywhere. Darla's dad was an Assemblies of God pastor, so I called the Assemblies of God. They used to have a beautiful district office building uh, with a big lake. It was a, it was a converted vineyard. Isn't that ironic? It was a vineyard where they used to make wine, and then they converted it to the Assemblies of God, who's against drinking and wine, the, their uh, district office. I spent three days and nights at that place, not eating. No, nobody was there. They, they'd shut it down for a week, not eating, just getting closer to Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, I got close, I've got close. i never been as close to Jesus as I was in those three days. I can't explain it. I don't know what happened. But when I took three days and did not eat and just drew close to the Lord, I, I'm just telling you, I experienced things with Jesus I, I can't even begin to describe. And so I do believe that. Fasting is feasting on Jesus. Um, Psalm 63, 1, um, the message version captures that. Now, y'all know I'm not a big message version guy, right? You do understand that. It's, very, it's a very loose translation. In fact, I saw a recipe for Rice Krispie Treats one time in the message. I'm joking. But it's a very loose translation. But I love what Psalm 63, 1 says in the message because it captures this idea that fasting is feasting on Jesus. So it says, here's Psalm 63, 1 in the message. God, you're my God. I cannot get enough of you. I've worked up such a hunger and thirst for God traveling across dry and weary deserts. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and your glory, and in your generous love, I'm really living at last. Isn't that great? That's what I mean when fasting is feasting on Jesus. So F-A-S-T, F is fellowship. If you've kind of hit a plateau in your time with Jesus, the best thing I can tell you to do is, is get along with him and take a day to pray and fast. It's amazing how that jumpstarts your relationship with Jesus. A, jot this down, is asking there's something about fasting that brings power to asking God for several things. Number one, asking for directions. Let me ask you this, just out of curiosity. If you're here tonight and you are kind of at a crossroads, you, you need a, an answer from the Lord, you need God's will in something dealing with your job, your family, uh, maybe school, what college to go to. If you're at a crossroads, and you really need some type of wisdom or direction from God, raise your hand right now. Okay. I'm going to tell you this. The best piece of advice I can ever give you when it's time to make a decision is before you make a major decision, spend some time fasting and praying. And here's why I see this in Scripture. Look at Acts 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. The early church, the church at Antioch, is on fire for the Lord, Great things are happening. The church at Antioch is seeing miracles, and they're at a crossroads. They're really seeking God's direction as to what is the next step of the church at Antioch. Acts uh, 13, 1. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, y'all heard of him before? All right, son of encouragement. Simeon, who's called Niger. It's kind of interesting. Mark says that, um, that when... Uh, I'll hit this in a second. All right, uh, Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now watch this. These are spirit-filled leaders. In fact, Mark says Simon of Cyrene is on the way to the, to, he's there in Jerusalem. Jesus is being led up to Golgotha. He falls down and, um, and the Roman soldiers say to this bystander, Simon of Cyrene, you, you carry his cross. You remember this? And Mark, in parentheses, gives the names of Simon's, uh, Simon of Cyrene's son. 
one of them, Rufus and Alexander. This is probably one of the sons of Simon of Cyrene. That's what tradition says. So these aren't just any spiritual leaders. These are the sons of Simon of Cyrene. This is Barnabas, one of the leaders in the early church. There are some high-level leaders here, and even these high-level leaders who need a word from God said, we're not gonna make a decision until, verse two, they minister to the Lord and they fast. And as a result of fasting, God breaks in and says, here's the direction I want you to go. Isn't that great? Now look, if these top level spiritual leaders needed to fast before they make a major decision, who do you and I think we are that we can make these decisions shooting from the hip and not pray and fast? Does it make sense? All right, let me give you another example of this. Daniel chapter nine, verse three. Daniel is really seeking God's direction. What's gonna happen to the people I love, my people, the people of Israel? God, what is their future? Daniel chapter nine, verse three says this. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Again, Daniel's a great man of God. He's not even a preacher. He's actually, do you know he works for the political system? He is a man of God working in a pagan political system. But Daniel prays, and it says right there, he fasted. And if you look at the rest of Daniel 9, God speaks to him with such clarity. Do you know this? In Daniel 9, we've done a study on this before. We don't have time to get into this tonight. But in Daniel 9, as a result of Daniel praying and fasting, do you know God gives Daniel the very date that the Messiah is going to ride into Jerusalem, 483 years from now? Did you know that? Sir Robert Anderson, who was basically... Uh, a brilliant man. He was over Scotland Yard, which is the British equivalent to the CIA. Sir Robert Anderson did a deep dive study on Daniel chapter nine. He wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And in The Coming Prince, he does all the math and said Daniel was given by God a revelation. 483 years from now, Daniel, the Messiah is gonna come in. But if you take the days, Daniel is told almost 500 years ahead of time the exact date that the Messiah is gonna ride into Jerusalem. Have you ever done a study on that before? It's amazing. But that kind of revelation came about because Daniel prayed and fasted. I'm gonna say the same thing. If Daniel needed a fast before he got directions from the Lord and insight from the Lord, who do you and I think we are that we can make these major decisions without spending a little bit of time praying and fasting? Exodus 34, 28. Moses is on Mount Sinai, and it says he was there with the Lord 40 days, and 40 nights, and he neither ate bread nor drank water. Now, remember I told you last week, that's a supernatural fast. Look at it right here. Don't do that, okay? You can't survive 40 days without water. God supernaturally provided for Moses. 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain, and then it says, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and if you look at the rest of Exodus, not only did he give him the Ten Commandments, God gives Moses very specific laws as a result of Moses spending 40 days praying and fasting. Do you see this? He seeks God's will in prayer and fasting, and God speaks very, very clearly. And again, I'm saying, if you're needing to get a definitive word from the Lord about a decision in your life, I want you to do the same thing. Spend some time praying and fasting. Let me give you one more example. Luke chapter 6 Jesus withdraws into the wilderness and he spends all night basically fasting from sleep. So he spends all night praying, implied in that I believe is, is physically fasting from food. We know he's fasting from uh, sleep and then the next day he chooses his 12 disciples. Jesus has, we know, literally hundreds of people following him. We know that there are 70 kind of fringe followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus needs to know, Father, what are the 12 out of this dozens and dozens of men? Who are the 12 that you have destined to be my disciples? Jesus did not shoot from the hip. He said, before I make this decision, I'm gonna spend time praying and fasting. So I'm gonna ask you the same thing again. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, needed to pray and fast before he made a decision, a major decision, who are going to be my 12 disciples, what makes you and I think that we can make decisions without praying and fasting? The Son of God had to do that. You with me? So, F, fellowship. If you want to get close to Jesus, fast. 
A is asking, if you need to ask for, first of all, directions, fast. I would say this as well. Ask for, if you need provision, there's some type of financial provision you need. There's some type of breakthrough that you need. I I would really encourage you to spend time praying and fasting and asking God for that. Jensen Franklin, remember I told you all about his book last week? Jensen Franklin has testimonies in this book on fasting where they needed a financial breakthrough in their church. They prayed and fasted, and God supernaturally came in. I want to get, this is a great story. I love this. Y'all know uh, Dallas Theological Seminary? You ever heard of that before? Dallas Theological is a great seminary. It was founded in 1924. It had only been open a short time, and a Dallas Theological Seminary almost folded. It was almost to the point of bankruptcy. Um, They've had some great graduates. Like I think David Jeremiah graduated from there. Chuck Swindoll graduated from there. But it almost folded. All the creditors were ready to foreclose at 12 o'clock noon on a particular day. So that morning, the founders of the school met in the president's office. His name was uh, Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer. To fast and to pray that God would provide. In that meeting was Harry Ironside. He was a great expositor of scripture. He's got some great stuff. Uh, Harry Ironside, when it was his turn to pray, he said very candidly, I love this, he said, quote, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine, so please sell some cattle and give us the money. We need the money. While they were praying and fasting, a tall Texan in boots and an open-collar shirt strolled into the business office of Dallas Theological Seminary. Howdy, he said to the secretary, I just sold two carloads of cattle over in Fort Worth I've been trying to make a business deal go through, but it just won't go through, and I feel that God wants me to give this money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. And he handed over the check to the secretary. The secretary took the check, and knowing something of the critical nature of that prayer and fasting meeting going on in the other room, she went to the door of the prayer meeting, and she timidly tapped on the door. The president of the seminary, Louis Sperry Schaefer, um, answered the door, and took the check out of her hand. When he looked at the amount, it was for the exact sum of the debt that they owed. And he recognized the name on the check as a prominent cattleman in the Fort Worth area. And turning to Dr. Ironside, he said, Harry, looks like God sold his cattle. Isn't that great? And so if you are needing direction, I would say ask with prayer and fasting. If you're needing a financial breakthrough, ask Um, with fasting. So F, fellowship, A, asking. S is subdue. That there's something about, I I believe in the tripartite view of of man. We are body, soul, and remember soul is mind, emotion, and will, and spirit. I want to be driven by the spirit man. I, I want this spirit where the spirit of Jesus lives. I want that to drive me. Here's my struggle. My flesh wants to drive me. My my soul, my mind, my emotions, my will, they want to drive me. There's something about fasting that seems to subdue that flesh part of me. And uh, Paul says something like this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. In other words, Paul says... I, the Apostle Paul, have to fight the flesh. Anybody here, your, your flesh? I've told you before. Now, I'm Irish. Any Irish folks here? Uh, I, I've, my, my family all has red hair, and we all have tempers, okay? There's something about my flesh that wants to bow up when I watch the news. When I, I, there's something in me that wants to bow up. That's my flesh. Here's what I'm finding. When I fast... It starts to subdue that flesh. If I'm going through seasons where my flesh is kind of getting a hold of me, I find if I take a day or two and just fast, it subdues that flesh. In fact, Paul says this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. That's what we're talking about right here. Fasting helps to train yourself for godliness. Jerry Bridges. Here's another good book you'd, you'd want. The Pursuit of Godliness is one of his books, and I think um, this other book, I think is from The Pursuit of Discipline. Jerry Bridges said this. As we engage in the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life, like fasting, the Holy Spirit molds us more into the character of the master. 
Probably the most common reason for the lack of spiritual growth among Christians is inconsistency with the spiritual disciplines like prayer and fasting. We don't grow in grace if we fail. Listen, I love this. We don't grow in grace if we fail to use the God-given means for growing in grace. It's a simple fact. Those who grow the most and the fastest are those who place themselves in the channel of grace uh, as the intake of God's word, prayer, worship, service, evangelism, silence, solitude, journaling, learning, fasting, and so on. What he's saying is, if you want to grow more and more like Jesus, the impetus is not on the Holy Spirit. It's on you. When you start to discipline yourself, then the Holy Spirit begins to do that transforming work. Does that make sense? Like, let me show you this diagram. I've used this before. I think we got this, the whole sanctification process. If, if we don't, we'll, we'll just skip it. Yeah, here we go. This is a snapshot of, of your Christian life. The fall, we are all fallen, messed up people. And the people of God said, amen, we're all fallen. Justification, the moment you repented of your sins and you said, that man, Jesus, he died for my sins. He took the punishment, he died in my place, I turned from my sins and I turned my life over to you. At that moment, God says, not guilty. You have passed from death into life, you are now justified, you're made right with God. That's justification. But here's where you're at right now, is the sanctification process. It's becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And notice, it's not a straight line. Have you noticed that? There'll be seasons where you're just growing in the Lord Jesus and you kind of fall backwards. And you're growing and you fall backwards. As long as the overall trajectory is over, that you can say, I'm more like Jesus now than I was five years ago. That's the sanctification process. And then number four is glorification. We will be like him for we shall see him as he is. Fasting is part of the sanctification process. Staying in the word of God. Going to church, what y'all doing tonight? That's part of the sanctification process. The saddest thing is to see Christians hit number two. They get saved, quote unquote, and they stay in that spot for the next 40 years. They don't grow at all in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what you're, you're part of that sanctification process and fasting is part of that. So if fasting is feasting on Jesus, it increases your fellowship. A, if you need to ask him for direction, for provision, you need to fast. Uh, S is subdue the flesh or you can put sanctification. It's part of this process. And then T is triumph. That's victory over sin in our life. Let me go back to um, this verse I shared with you last week, Isaiah 58, 6. Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? God says, when you fast, I want Satan's yoke. You know what I mean by yoke, not Y-O-L-K, Y-O-K-E. I want Satan's yoke that he has on you. I want that broken. Th this bondage that he has you in, when you fast, I want to see that broken is what God says. Remember, in, uh, now this is a textual variant um, in the King James Version, Matthew 17, 29, Mark 9, 29, this demon is harassing this little boy. Jesus cast the demon out. The disciples said, why can't we do this? Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said, this kind only goes out by prayer and fasting. Now, again, I understand this is a textual variant, but I think the King James has it right on that. What Jesus is saying is there are some demonic issues in your life that can only be broken, not just through prayer, but also through fasting. And the verb in the original tense is a continuous verb. So Jesus says we should be continuously fasting to get power over besetting sins. And this may involve fasting for a longer time or more often than we might have expected. Let me read this and then I'm, I'm gonna hit, there's some questions I missed last week, so I'm gonna hit a couple of these questions. Um, but listen to this. Talk about triumphing over sin. I read this from a, a Christian leader who wrote, Quote, in 2006, I overcame an addiction to pornography that had me trapped since I was about 10 years old. 10 year. Incidentally, parents, if you're giving your 10-year-old boy one of these little things with unfettered access, you're, you're destroying that little boy. There needs to be guards. I'm not saying don't give it to him. I'm saying there better be tight. I know Chad Harvey. If I was a 10, 12, 13-year-old boy and you said, here, Chad, he had 24-7 access to the internet. I would not be pastoring a church today, okay? You, you need to make sure that those guards are there. But anyway, he said, I've been addicted since I was 10 years old. I was desperate to end this addiction. 
and I've been asking God to get me out of it. I prayed and asked God to free me from pornography. Day after day, week after week, I asked. Month after month, year after year, I asked, but I still was not free. However, I did struggle a long time to get over it until I fasted. I fasted for seven non-consecutive days. I fasted for three consecutive days. During this fast, I ate nothing at all and only drank water. Three months later, I did the same thing again. I fasted for another three consecutive days as I had done before. And as I engaged in these fasts, my desire to look at pornography miraculously began to disappear. This was a miracle to me. My mind and my heart have been so corrupted since I was 10 years old, yet God, through his son Jesus, gave me mercy and grace to overcome this addiction, and only God could provide his only son Jesus to get me out of this addiction. I found mercy and grace. Freedom is already there and available for anyone who is really serious to get over their addiction. Isn't that a, it's amazing. I tried for years, and it was fasting that broke that porn addiction. So F-A-S-T. Now, I'm running out of time here, but real quickly, questions, there's a couple questions that Nikki sent me over that I didn't get to from last, uh, last week on fasting. So let me hit a couple of these, and then we'll see if we got some more tonight. One question was this from last week. I don't know if you're here who asked this or who sent this in. Uh, what do you recommend for folks who want to fast but that work extremely busy jobs that make it very difficult to focus on the fast? You don't eat all day. Uh, but not a lot of prayer and intentional focus during the workday, so it feels like you're just uh, skipping meals. And so uh, I would say several things. I really believe even the act of fasting, even if you can't, sat- so I'm a blue-collar worker or I, I'm a very busy person, and I'm gonna fast lunch tomorrow. But I know I'm gonna be inundated with stuff during that lunchtime, so I can't pray. I still believe even that act of fasting, even if you can't saturate the entire time in prayer, I think there's something powerful in that. And from what I read, even blue-collar workers can fast one meal. I would say this as well. If you can, find a season in your life, like I got vacation coming up, or I'm gonna have an extended, uh, you know, maybe an extended weekend because of Easter, that would be a great time to say, if you got an extended Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Maybe spend those three days just fasting. But I understand the quandary there, so I would say there's something powerful just in the act of fasting, even if you can't saturate that time in prayer. And then secondly, look at your, your, your schedule here and try to find maybe a day or two where you can just take off work and do that. But that's, that's a great question. Number two, how many times a year do the Jews fast? Uh, it's interesting. So The Jewish people, because we love the Jewish people, that's part of our biblical heritage is uh, the Jewish people. And so understand there's two kinds of Judaism. Well, there's actually multiple, but the kinds of Judaism we like, we're not into the liberal Judaism. The, the, The kind of Judaism we'd be drawn to, there's rabbinic Judaism, that's the tradition of the rabbis, and there's biblical uh, Judaism. Biblical Judaism, forget about the traditions of the rabbis, Biblical uh, Judaism only has one day of fasting through the year. Uh, That's the Day of Atonement, Leviticus uh, 23, 26 through 32. That's the only prescribed day when you have to fast. That's in biblical Judaism. In rabbinic Judaism, they actually have two days. One is the Day of Atonement, and then the the other one is called uh, Tisha B'Av. It's the ninth day of the month of Av, the the Hebrew month of Av. Uh, The ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av uh, that's when they said the 12 spies went out and they came back and gave a bad report and God says, because of the bad report, you're not going into the promised land for 40 years. That ha- happened on uh, Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av. On the ninth day of the month of Av was also when Solomon's temple was destroyed and when Herod's temple was destroyed and when the, uh, uh, the Bar Kokhba re- rebellion uh, one something was destroyed. And so that particular day has been a horrendous day in Judaism. So the rabbi said, you fast on the day of atonement and you fast on that day. But in the Bible, there's only one day that you have to to fast if you're a Jew and that's the day of atonement. Um, Number three, it's a great question. Since God is all powerful, sovereign, why would he call us to fast for healing and deliverance? Um, Last week I thought about a missionary who almost died but the church fasted, remember that? 
Well, that missionary, would he have died had the church not fasted? Will God withhold his blessing in certain situations if someone doesn't fast? You understand the question? If God's sovereign, y'all believe he's sovereign? God's in control. Well, then why fast? Because he's gonna do what he's gonna do. That question, it's an age-old question, and it can be asked about prayer as well. If God's sovereign, why do you pray? And so my best answer is this. God says, I am sovereign. I'm sovereign, and I have sovereignly decreed that I'm not gonna give you some things unless you pray and fast for them. I've sovereignly decided that. Okay, that's the best thing I can come up with, but we do see God is sovereign in the Bible, but we also see God, I mean, you can't get away from this. God goes a different direction than he said he was going to go because of the prayers and fasting of people. Remember how God says to Moses, Moses, I'm tired of these Israelites Drive me up a wall, I'm gonna kill them all, and we're gonna start all over again with you. That's what he's gonna do. And Moses prayed, he interceded. Did God destroy all the Jews and start over again? He went in a different direction. Now, did God really not, he was just kind of playing with Moses. He went, well, it says, God said, I've, I've decided I'm gonna do this, but I'll, I'll do this instead. God says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to kill. And, God, and Abraham says, if you find, and he kind of gets that, 10 righteous people. God says, Abraham, if there's 10 righteous people, I've changed my mind. I'll save them. So God is sovereign, but God has said, I have sovereignly wired this thing where I'll change my mind. I'll go a different direction based on the prayer and the fasting of my people. Um, so again, a lot of good stuff. I wish we could, uh, we could get to it. Uh, let me hit a couple of these other questions and then we're gonna let you guys uh, discuss. Let's see what we got here. Um, here's a good one. Actually, this is one of those I wrote down here. I, I didn't know if I had time to hit this or not. Is the lack of fasting a sin and potentially hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? It's actually two questions. Is not fasting a sin? The answer to that is no. If, if not fasting was a sin, the Bible would have come right out and said, thou shalt fast, okay? And that, now, remember I said last week, it's implied that we're gonna fast, but it's not commanded that we fast. Like, does the Bible say to pray? Yes, pray without ceasing. There are, there are admonitions throughout the Bible to tell us to pray. It never tells us you must fast, okay? So the answer to the, the first part of that, is the lack of fasting a sin? No. But is the lack of fasting potentially hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? The answer to that is yes. So God says, I love you, but man, my Holy Spirit wants to make you more and more like Jesus Christ. There's some incredible things he's wanting to do in your life, but you're not putting yourself under the fountain of, of my, uh, my grace here. And if you will fast and pray and become a spiritually disciplined person, God is saying you'll be amazed at what the Holy Spirit does in your life. So it's not a sin, but it could be hindering the work of the Holy Spirit if you don't fast. Um, let's see. Um, and again, here's a great one. How do you fast at home with daily responsibilities, kids, work, etc.? cetera? Uh, and so I'm wondering if maybe a mother wrote this. I, I do think, ladies, one meal can be fasted, even if you're a busy mama with kids running all over the place. Y'all have heard me tell this story before. John Wesley, y'all heard of John Wesley? And Charles Wesley, man, they had a godly mother named Susanna Wesley. I can't remember how many siblings. They had like 10 or 12 siblings. Can you imagine 10 or 12 little kids running around? And, but the mama was a godly woman. And with all this going on in the house, when she needed to have her time with Jesus, Susanna Wesley would take her apron and stand there and put it over her head and stand in the middle of the kitchen. And the kids knew if mama is standing there with the apron over her head, you don't mess with her. You leave her alone because she's talking to Jesus. Isn't that great? So you might have to find some creative ways to pray and fast, but I do think you can be a, a busy uh, mama and still do that. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, and the, the, another question, you know, why is Matthew 17, 21, this only goes out by prayer and fasting. Why is that in some versions and not others? I don't wanna get into textual criticism tonight. And that's not a bad term, textual criticism. We've got like 20,000 ancient copies of the New Testament, 20,000. There is no other book in the world that has that type of attestation. Like uh, Livy's, uh, was it his, 
one of the, 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 the biography of Julius Caesar, there's only like four copies. And those four copies are like 800 years after the original. 20,000 copies of the Greek New Testament. So every now and then, you'll find some ancient Greek manuscripts that say one thing and some that say another. They're not a lot. Like we're 99% on the same page. This is one of those times where one ancient Greek manuscript includes prayer and fasting, and then there's another one that doesn't. So that's a woefully inadequate description of, uh, of textual criticism. Um, there was one more I thought. Here's, here's another good one. Um, Actually, I got two more. How would you describe the difference between someone's soul and spirit? So this tripartite view of man, we believe in one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I wonder, this is, because you don't want to get into modalism, but I do wonder if part, a small part of being created in the image of God is we reflect that threeness. I'm body, I'm soul, and I'm spirit. And remember, body is your physical, this is your body, your soul is your mind, your emotions, and your will. And your spirit is that core of who you really are, okay? And there is in the Bible overlap between soul and spirit. It's not as neatly divided as we would like. So that question, what is the difference between your soul and spirit, they're all really interconnected. Like, if your body is laying in the hospital sick for 12 weeks, you think that's gonna start impacting your soul, your mind? Your emotions, your will, yeah. And do you think that you might get to the point where that's starting to make you doubt? Well, does God really love me? Where is God in a time like that? So you see that? Your body, your soul, your spirit, they're all interwoven and they're impacted by that. There's one more. Uh, what about David when he fasted for his child to live? Y'all remember that story? He gets Bathsheba uh, pregnant. He sends Bathsheba's husband. Anybody remember his name? Uriah, into the battle, and he's killed. Interestingly, uh, you know where that took place? It took place in Amman, Jordan. I was in uh, Amman several years ago with some missionaries, and we're in this high rise, and I looked down, and I saw this beautiful little, it looked like a park, and I said, um, I said, that's a beautiful park. What is that? They said, that's the ancient city of Amman. They said, it was that spot right there where Uriah was killed during the battle. It's kind of interesting. But um, Bathsheba gives birth to this baby, and the baby's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And David prays, and he fasts. And God breaks through, and the baby is supernaturally healed and grows up to be a wonderful baby. Is that what happens? Baby dies. Ex explain that. Explain how a man of faith prays and fasts, and he does not get his miracle. When I know of other people who have prayed and fasted, and they did get their miracle. And I think that's gonna be one of your discussion questions tonight. And so if you think that this is a vending machine type thing, you put in the right fasting quarters and push whatever you want, God's gonna give it to you. God doesn't operate like that. And so that, that again is one of your discussion questions this evening. So look, this is our last, um, last Wednesday together for about a month or so. Can I pray for you? Because I, uh, I just think God's doing something big in our church. I think he's doing something big in your family. I, don't, I just got this sense God is stirring something up. And so I want us to close this time out now by let me just pray for you and then my brother will come up and give you guys some directions. And so Father, I thank you for these men and women. And God, when I say that, you know my heart, that isn't just a trite thing I'm saying. I, I thank you for these men and women. Because they're being here tonight, Father, it tells me they're hungry. They want to be more like Jesus. They want to get deeper into the word. Lord, they're not satisfied with where they're at spiritually. And so, God, I just proclaim that the God who began the good work in every person here tonight is going to carry that work on to completion in Christ Jesus. Father, I have been praying for a long time that you'll raise up an army at Cross Assembly. And I believe, Father, this is the beginnings of that army. Mighty men and women who are intercessors, who are prayer warriors, who rise up and shake the very foundations of our nation. Father, build an army of intercessors here at Cross Assembly. And may it start with these men and women. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Brother Joel, come on up here, brother. Uh, we have a little bit of a competition on who can fast the best here. North Raleigh sent us an image of what they're doing to fast. We've got Pastor Joe. 
We had got food trucks up at North Raleigh tonight, so we're really taking this fasting uh, piece serious tonight. But look, no, actually, that was a, an event, the North Raleigh team. Pastor Joe challenged the youth of North Raleigh to see, to raise money for Speed the Light, if you guys are familiar, familiar with that. And if they hit certain levels, he would bring food trucks out on the last night. And in fact, maybe we'll get a picture of this too. Later on, I think Pastor Joe's getting a pie in his face because they hit, they, they hit their goal. They raised $2,000 this semester for Speed the Light. So that's pretty cool. But look, um, yeah, like Pastor said, tonight is our last night. I just want to first just thank all of you guys for coming out this semester. I know this semester has been kind of an atypical semester. Every Our Wednesdays were kind of, we had vision night, which is always a great thing we get to do. We also had a guest speaker with Jonathan Kahn come through. We also have been, do, you know, increasing our priority for prayer with doing the prayer nights, but it has caught, created a different, different rhythm for us that we're still getting used to for our Wednesday night. So I just want to thank all you guys for just being just sticking with us coming out here because Wednesday nights is all about getting people connected and we get them connected to other like-minded Christians within the body so we can build each other up so first of all thank you for coming also look we go into um our, our church does a calendar of build and rest months so we were on we build for three months and we rest for one build for three rest for one so April will be a rest month so that means no midweek activities. So no no kids services, no um, youth services, and no 242s will happen in April. We'll keep doing Sundays. We'll do Sundays until Jesus comes back. But the midweeks, all the midweek activity takes a break, just gives all the, the resource providers here a time to rest, and then we will launch back in May. Our first Wednesday in May will be actually May the 1st. Um, it will be a prayer service. Our first Wednesday prayer services will kick back off, and then the first 242 will be the following May the 8th. Also happening in May is a new event. It's going to be our group's leadership gathering. So we're starting an annual event to really celebrate what God does within our group's body. And so this will be May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Um, it's a Sunday. It's going to be after, it's be after uh, services. It'll be, it's an evening event from 5 to 8. We're opening this to all of our group's leaders, it, our coaches, our directors, including our apprentices. So if you're an apprentice now, please come out and join us for that. Um, and we're also opening it to anybody who's not in a group or not leading a group but is interested to learn more about what our vision is, some ways we celebrate, some ways we have some fun. We're going to have all our pastors involved with this. So it's going to be a good time, and we just invite anybody who's interested in being a part of our group's team or who is currently a part of it to come out to that. The, the, the leaders have, you've had text messages and, and emails showing you how to sign up for that, and then the, the greater body and emails going out this week. So watch for that, and uh, please join us on May the 5th. And with that, I will turn you over to all of your leaders and let you get into these discussion questions and, and be back to close this out one more time for the semester. Thanks.